What's up, coach? In today's video, I'm sitting down with Megan Barrington. We're talking about women's wellness through a different lens. What's up, coach? I'm super excited to get this episode out to you today. So if you are new here and you haven't already, please hit like, hit subscribe, and tap that bell to be notified when the next latest and greatest video comes out. So I sat down with Megan Barrington, who is stunning to be a physical therapist in Baylor. She's studying to get her doctorate of physical therapy at Baylor. And this is an incredible episode. So without further ado, let's go ahead and roll that interview. What's up, Megan? Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. How are you doing? Yeah, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I am great. It's sunny here and I'm in Washington state. So hopefully that means it's going to stay sunny for a while. <laughs> That's so nice. I love that. We're here. I'm in New York and it's now getting in that season where the sun stays out just a little bit longer and it feels like, oh, summer is coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's just dive right in. Okay. We to sharing with us a little bit about who you are, who you serve, and how you got there. Yeah, so it's kind of a long story. Um, I mean, I'm 30, so it can't be that long. But uh, so I am currently uh, getting my doctorate in physical therapy at Baylor University. And prior to that, uh, I well, I still am a certified athletic trainer and a strength and conditioning coach. Um, I got my master's in athletic training uh, from the University of Arkansas, Woo Pig. And prior to that, I was, uh, I did my undergrad in physiology. Um, I'm a science geek, which is really fitting for, I guess, a future physical therapist, but yeah. So, um, currently what I'm, I mean, I'm full-time in school, so I am, you know, doing some like personal training on the side. Uh, but predominantly my time right now is spent during school. Cause it's my program is actually, it's a hybrid program. So it's only two years instead of three. And so it is drink it from a fire hose, but I I've so far been so impressed with how Baylor has really, um, just pivoted with like the current circumstances that we're in and just how they handle our education. Um, obviously it's my only experience, but it's been pretty, pretty cool. And I think, uh, my background has kind of helped me, um, with the learning curve a little bit, but there's definitely new things that I'm learning from a different lens. But yeah, that's, that's me kind of in a nutshell, I guess we can go from there. <laughs> that I definitely want to talk about the lens that you're learning from and what caused you to, you know, go there. Uh, but before that, just real quick, have you always been an athlete? Like from, from young age? Like uh, yeah. I mean, I was always my family, like growing up, my family's really active, like always hiking, you know, doing all sorts of outdoorsy stuff. Um, our family will typically like work out or cook together. So it's a, it's a pretty good mix. That's kind of like what I'd like to do now. Um, but I played volleyball pretty much year round um, growing up. And then I played tennis and did a little bit of track also, but predominantly volleyball. And I just, I think like, you know, sports are kind of like art, um, the way the body moves and all the different things that you can kind of apply through movement, which is um, actually more what I'm getting into now uh, with my training. We can talk about that a little bit, um, but I also have a, a background in bodybuilding. So when I first got into um, like strength training or conditioning, all those kind of things, it was, I was just in high school as a high school athlete were required to take, you know, a zero period weights class. And I was actually one of the few girls that actually really liked it. And like, you know, would actually work hard and like actually wanted to come to class. And it was, you know, five 30 in the morning. Um, so that's kind of where I, I fell in love with exercise, to be honest. And then when I was in grad school, um, I think I really, I think it was just because I was in a gym where there were a lot of, you know, competitive bodybuilders that were at my gym. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got into competing, um, which is, it's so weird. Cause like when you live something, it's like, doesn't seem that weird, but then you realize like how few people do it. And you realize how strange it is for like the rest of society to see someone like dieting hardcore for, you know, I mean, up to 20 weeks sometimes for people's preps. Um, and just like, you know, just, it just, everything is planned to a T, you know, it, I, there's parts about, I'm not currently competing. It's not like off the table, but there's parts about it that I just, I will always apply the discipline that I learned through that. Um, to, to like all facets of my life. But what's interesting is like most bodybuilders, um, you know, it's very like segmental based with, you know, you're, you're targeting specific muscle groups, obviously, you know, your hypertrophy is pretty simple in that regard, but, um, I mean, it's not simple, but <laughs> it's more straightforward than like, you know, training for a sport, I guess, uh, where you're going to have to perform a certain way. 
But what is interesting is like, I've always just liked more like quote unquote functional training, which I just made air quotes. I know nobody can see my fingers, but I just made air quotes. Um, just cause it's, it's like, if you think about it, like the human body, a, a bodybuilding physique is a symmetrical body, which is, you know, I mean, I would say if you're moving the way that the body was made to move, then you're going to probably grow the way the body was supposed to grow. Um, obviously there's like different proportions and things like that, that you're looking for. But, um, I've just always enjoyed like functional training. I'm not talking like CrossFit. I'm talking like actually like, you know, bipedal mm -hmm. alternating movements, those kind of things. Um, not like there's anything wrong with CrossFit. Sometimes people think I do CrossFit and I really like wads. So, um, but yeah, so I, I feel like my, my style of training is a little bit different. Um, and then of course, like I'm, I'm about like, you know, getting, getting stronger, not just like looking a certain way. So I don't know. I honestly don't feel like I fit in really any kind of a camp. Like I'm kind of weird to the bodybuilding crowd. I'm most definitely weird to like the rehab crowd because like, I don't know. I feel like to a lot of physical therapists, I, I'm like too strength coachy. Like I'm too like hardcore, but then to a lot of like strength coaches, I'm like too fluffy, like, you know, rehabby, like this is too corrective, but to me, it's the same, you know, and there's things that you can do, like even within one training session, um, that can just, they can really add to each other. And I think with, um, I guess my entire point to this, tr uh, huge tangent is I, I, I started bodybuilding. I guess that was kind of where I like really, truly fell in love with like, um, physique and just movement in general and then kind of branched off like I I know you probably know Katie St. Clair um and I've had several mentors prior to her who like it, I've done my strong first SFG certification so just really just mixing different modalities you know and I think that there's so much that you can gain from learning from multiple different sources rather than like going down one rabbit hole and like feeling like that's just you know you know the, the epitome of everything so it's very humbling to like learn from different people. Cause you're like, Shit, nobody really knows anything. All these people are saying the same thing, but with different words and like trying to sound smart by making it like newer or like more neurological based or whatever. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's kind of just me in a nutshell. I'm really excited. Um, once I, I get my doctorate, you know, knock on wood that I pass my boards and everything in, you know, over a year. So I got, I got some time, but, um, I would love to just kind of meld all these different things in addition to what I'm learning now. Like the anatomy that we're learning right now is like, I mean, it's insane. It's so intricate. We are so intricately made. It's, it's ridiculous. Oh, I'd love for you to share on that. I'd love for you to share on that. And oh God. Also, and also, like you don't have to go into like a le lecture us or teach us in that way. But <laughs> what I guess I'm also really curious about is how do you plan as you move forward to blend what you know blend your camps and your skill level and what you hope to bring to who right and the other thing is interesting you said two things uh when you were telling us about your bodybuilding world because i think there's something really specific in there that a lot of people miss i feel like a lot of people think of bodybuilding as oh they just want to look good but it's more than that it's more about press it's it's the mental discipline the mental and the physical discipline you guys like push boundaries that most people can't do I mean y'all are like regulating water intake before you get on the stage which is yeah it's not fun Sick. um yeah I mean I think only people that have done it could really appreciate that statement um but it is the furthest thing from glamorous the furthest yeah. thing yeah yeah, like for sure. Even even on stage when you're like in a sparkly thong bikini and like lo you look glamorous, if you get closer, it's really like not glamorous. It's like oopa loompa tan, like you know, crazy <laughs> makeup. So yeah, I mean, I have the utmost respect for anyone at any level that competes, just because I know how much it takes. It takes guts. It takes grit. It takes you know mental fortitude, especially because your brain cells are like gone by that point in prep. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so what I what I was gonna say was. So when I graduate, um, I don't want to like pigeonhole myself. Uh, I want to leave my, my mind kind of open to different opportunities, but if I could have my way right now, um, I I'm really interested in women's health, uh, just in general, like, you know, not even just like, uh, anatomical biomechanical stuff or like anything pelvic floor related, which that is definitely part of it, but just like educating women on like their own body. And like what we should understand if we're like planning on having children someday or have had children or have a vagina, you know, like you have, and the hormones that we have, like all those things are going to affect like 
you know, our athletics, our mind, our daily life, you know? So I would love to have like a collaborative practice um, where I worked with, you know, an MD or an ND and then dietitians, things, people who are specializing in different components of the healthcare system. Um, but then melding, you know, women's health, physical therapy with like strength and conditioning. Cause I feel like there's not a ton of, um, like guidance for women. Um, or, or there's honestly not a lot of like physical therapy is really hard to do research in. Um, cause it's like, obviously there's ethical, ethical things with like, okay, well, this person's going to get placebo and this person's not going to get anything or is going to get like a certain care or whatever. And then there's so much subjectivity to it. Um, so it's difficult to know, like outcomes wise, like what is the most helpful, but I do know, um, at least from my little experience that I have is just like educating. And if you can relate something that someone is going through to like something that they understand, like if they have a certain amount of pain somewhere or dysfunction, and then you can kind of like just create a, a picture in their mind that works. You don't have to use like big sciencey fancy words. Um, but yeah, and even just, I mean, just women throughout the lifespan, but I don't necessarily only want to work with women, but I feel like that is the audience that I, obviously I'm a woman, so I connect most and I'm very passionate about it because I feel like there were things that I wish I would have known when I was younger, um, that I've just learned now. And like, just, you know, seeing a lot of my friends are having kids now, like you have kids, obviously. I mean, anyone who has children, I don't have children yet. Um, it's just crazy. Like what our bodies can do. Like we grow humans. That's nuts. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't feel like we're educated on it. Yes. I mean, I've shared before multiple times, people have heard me say that I, you know, I had a, my eldest was born in 2015. That's not that long ago. And I knew absolutely zero. I mean, when I say I knew absolutely zero, I'm telling you, my sister called me right before I was going to give birth and said, Hey, just so you know, you're still going to look pregnant when the baby comes out. And I was oh like, gosh, baby's out. <laughs> <laughs> be fine and she's well, like, um do you have any idea what's about to happen to you I'm like no it's gonna be fine it's crazy yeah I mean it's just and then even just like I have a client who um like I have clients that are going through menopause and it, that affects your body in a completely different way too like it's just it's kind of like it's cool but it's also kind of unfair like how our body is like never the same body like you know, you go through puberty and then all this weird stuff happens. And then you have kids and all this weird stuff happens. And then you finally start to feel normal again. And then all this weird stuff happens. Like I just, it's, you have to be super adaptive, like mentally as a female, I feel like not to say that men don't go through things as well. Plus they have to deal with us and they don't like know <laughs> exactly what we're going through. So I can only imagine how hard that is, but, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very passionate about that. Um, but I also, because I'm an athletic trainer and I've worked in um, like secondary school setting, I've never, I, I decided not to do the college route. Um, so I've been working just secondary school for the last four years. And so I'm, I'm also really passionate about working with kids because I feel like they're so, like they're so malleable and like we have a huge problem with like kids specializing too early in sports and like just they're going like you know couch potato to like playing in a sport which obviously activity is good but I just think there's so much that could be added to like developing skills and understanding of their body that they can take with them past high school because there's so many high school athletes that like what like two percent go to college and then after that how many go to to pro, like none of these kids are necessarily going to be athletes their whole life, at least not in the sporting setting. Um, what if we can give them the, the habits that they, that they should have when they're in high school and even middle school, um, or even elementary school. I mean, you can do tons of stuff with young kids too. Like actually those are really fun because you get to play games with them. Um, but just, I, I really want to meld physical therapy with like more strength and conditioning and preventative stuff. Like you don't have to be an athlete to do strength and conditioning, right? You have to be a human being with a body in my opinion. Okay. So you've said so many things. I feel like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We can go down in like 300 million different ways because I think it, it uh, speaks to a little bit of what you were saying when you were talking about your story. Cause you, cause I feel like that was, it's similar to me when I was up and coming in strength and conditioning back in the day. I mean, 
few years ago. Um, but when I was training is that we get into these camps, right? We get into a dogmatic lens of how we view fitness. And I even hear you talk about it when I hear you say that, you know, teen kids are specializing in sports way too soon. And that what essentially is also happening is that they're getting into a very dogmatic approach into their training and their context lens becomes very narrow. And then we are not building resilient humans. And so the fact that so many people, and by, and, and I, I want to say so many people, cause I feel like it, the industry is shifting, but I feel like we got a long way to go, especially as a former, I was SFG to, as well. Mm. I just feel like my, my friends have now, and the people that I associate with have now changed. So I feel like there's a lot of room for the industry to really just bust through some of their dogmatic approaches and I get that it's human nature mm -hmm. but I think that it it would serve us to fight against it yeah it really is human nature mm -hmm. like with anything we just want to like belong to a club uh -huh. like I mean way beyond exercise like other things that have gone on in the past year but um yeah I mean I don't I don't know I think I mean America in general just needs to move more mm -hmm. um but if we were to like, you know, start educating people earlier and not take away PE from school, like, I can't believe that's even happening, but, um, yeah, it's funny because obviously like I will, we both kind of live in a bubble where we like love the body and think it's so cool. And like, we're constantly, or at least I'm constantly thinking about it and like thinking about movement and like wanting to take care of this, like meat sack that I live in, but I know that's not everyone's reality. And so it's like hard to like want to like impose your passion on someone else who maybe they're just in pain and they don't want to be in pain or maybe they just want to like like how they look more which I don't know I feel like anyone who like wants to like how they look I feel like I could get them and like hmm. help them have like a better connection with themselves and just like a better relationship with like their body rather than just like wanting to look a certain way like if you can just understand or like get stronger um, that's a little easier person to connect with but the people that just have you know, no interest in it. It's, it's hard to like connect with them. And I don't really know how I'm going to help future clients in that way, but I guess I'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, right? Cause I've, you know, I'll tell, you know, I'll share and I'll be transparent. I've talked about it a little bit in my social is that, you know, you've heard the phrase, you know, sleep beget sleep, right? And the more you, you end up every time you don't get sleep, you end up waking up later in your insomnia stays, you know, longer and it starts to get worse, right? Mm -hmm. Outside, you know, and I'm speaking about this generally, I know that there's like lots of, this is a nuanced conversation, but I'll say that I notice with my children, oh no, if we go to bed late, they're gonna be up early tomorrow. Always happens that way, right? So I feel like that has happened with my own habit, my own habits in terms of working out. Like it's almost the less, the more busy I get and stop working out, the mm -hmm. more I have no time to do it. Yeah. You know, and what ends up happening, which I think happens to so many people is that we think that we're okay, but we're really just in self-deception mm -hmm. and we don't really have a full understanding of what it would, would be like to be running like an optimal human. We think that we're running like an optimal human, but we just don't know what that would feel like. And then therefore start thinking it's not possible for us. Oh, that's only for athletes or, oh, that's only for the top. You know, I have to, it has to be hard to live mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I really like about what I'm, I'm learning in school um, or like some of the curriculum that we're covering is, you know, we have a, like a health promotion class, which um, I'm glad that at least my program is going that direction. Like the very, like, you know, kind of preventative type side rather than just, or like whole person side rather than just like, oh, okay, this bone and this joint isn't moving properly. Let's like massage it and whatever. Um, but anyway, so they, I mean, we've touched on a lot of like sleep and nutrition. Like we actually, one of our professors, um, which I'm just going to put a little plug for Baylor. It's pretty cool that they can have their faculty from literally all over the country. They, they can literally get the best people from all different realms of PT and have them, you know, add to our education, which I think is pretty cool. But anyway, we have um, Dr. Berner. He is a dietitian and a physical therapist, which is a pretty cool mix. Like, honestly, because I feel like so many clients and patients 
I mean, their sleep hygiene and their nutrition are probably two massive things that are impacting, you know, their, their injury or their condition or their, even their perception of their condition. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, our health performance class or health promotion class rather, um, you know, we're talking about sleep hygiene. And what I think is really funny is I'm super snobby with my sleep. Like, I think that's, that is, I think one of the most important things that I just keep in like my sleep and my, my training, whether it's in whatever capacity, like, even if it's like a 20 minute workout, um, I feel like those two things really help fill my cup. And so I feel like I can do more for other people with, I, when I keep those things in check, um, which I know that's not always everyone's, um, reality, but that's what I, my reality can be right now. So I'm going to just keep doing it. Um, but anyway, so I've noticed like a lot of my classmates, um, they like say their sleep hygiene isn't really that great. And like it, I, I forget how like in undergrad, I would be so inconsistent with my sleep and how, I don't know how I functioned to be quite honest, but maybe I'm just older now. And so I'm more of a wuss, but <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, I can feel like if I get two days of like crappy sleep, like I can, I can feel my mental state. I'm just like really not with it. I'm physically obviously more tired. I have more cravings. Like you feel like puffier. I mean, it's just, we could fix so many things with just like sleeping better and then just improving nutrition just a little bit. Like we don't have to like overhaul. We can just improve it a little bit, you know? And I love that you go there because I think that's also another thing is that I think that our industry, you know, teaches people that, oh, it has to be hard. You have to overhaul. You have to go and grind yourself into the floor, do Peloton, do things. Yeah. Oh God, don't get me started. <laughs> so people are taught that they need to grind themselves into the ground in an already, in a society that's already grinding. Like we're uh -huh. all grinding. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Actually work less, but just more efficiently. Like it can be hard, but just not hard in the way that we're taught it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too, is like, um, I mean, I, I do a pretty good job. I think maybe this is the athletic trainer in me is with like acute stress. I'm like pretty good at like just staying calm and managing things, but it's the kind of like, Oh, slow cooking overwhelm because Megan, you put too much stuff on your plate again, you know? Um, but if we could just teach like as physical therapists, as personal trainers, as whoever working with other human beings that are struggling and wanting to create new habits. Like if we were just able to somehow communicate with them, like, Hey, your perception, like the, literally the only things that we can control are our perception and like our effort, you know, like if we are, if we're interpreting something as a lion running at us, like, obviously we're going to get stressed out. If we can just like sit back, stay calm and just like be, you know, um, I don't want to say mechanical, but metho methodical with like the things that we need to get done, which is just how I try to run with my school. Cause I mean, obviously in this, my program is accelerated. So there's constantly like all this stuff. They're like, Oh, we don't want to overwhelm you, but <laughs> overwhelm like, Oh, we know you have other classes, but <laughs> okay. Let's just like load everything on at once. Like I'm it's, it's a mile a minute for sure. But if we just stay organized and just realize like, okay, they know we're not superhuman. I know I'm not superhuman. I'm just going to do what I can with what I have, where I am, and it'll all be okay. Like, I'm going to live. I'm going to live. I'm going to pass. Like, it'll be fine. So if we could just be able to kind of arrest ourselves when that anxiety is kind of welling up, mm -hmm. which easier said than done. And especially like if you like anxiety begets anxiety also. So like if you are a person who panics because you're panicking, like, of course you're going to keep panicking, you know, and it's just, you feed those neurological circuits in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so if you can just, you know, look outside yourself and catch yourself like, Oh, that's what I do sing every single time this exact same scenario comes up. Like maybe if I just start training my brain to like, think of it a different way or just be like, okay, Hey, I lived last time. Like I will live again this time. Like, let's just like take this as an opportunity to exercise, staying mellow and calm in a situation where I could otherwise freak the hell out, which that's not going to help anybody. So <laughs> yeah. So, oh, uh, totally. I totally get that. So I definitely, there's two things I do want to touch on real quick based on something you've said. We've opened that loop and I'd love to close it. Cause I am curious, you were talking about women's health and how you want to focus on women's health, but not, but not necessarily specifically pelvic floor, which is what I think a lot of people go to when they're like, oh, women's health, pelvic floor. And I know that that's something I used to go to or but it was only introduced to me when we were talking about pregnancy, preg you know, pre, post, 
postpartum days, but there's so much more components, like you were saying, to women's health, like puberty, like, um, you know, you were talking about kids getting, you know, building resilient bodies mm -hmm. from the young age, and then you've got menopause and perimenopause. So I'm, you know, we talk a lot about, and by a lot, I mean, it's not a lot. It's just the main focus. I mean, mm -hmm. women's health needs a lot of attention, in my opinion. Yeah. But um, I'd love to hear more about like some of the other lenses that you are looking at when you're talking about and thinking about women's health. Yeah. Well, I mean, just in general, like um, you don't have to have kids or any kind of like known issue to get like tightness or dysfunction in your pelvic floor. And if you have tightness or dysfunction in your pelvic floor, you can bet your bottom dollar that that's going to affect the way that you brace the rest of your core. Because obviously like it's, if you think about the core as like you know, a can of soup or whatever, the round the outside of the can of soup is like your abdominal muscles, you know, your TVA, especially. And then you have like your diaphragm, your thoracic diaphragm on top, and then the pelvic floor is the bottom. So if one of those things is like not quite doing its job when it should be, um, which I don't know if you, I mean, you know this, but do you want me to like explain? Oh, mm -hmm. So when you inhale, when you take a deep breath in your diaphragm in your, in your rib cage or the bottom of your rib cage should go down and your pelvic floor should go down with it. So everything should kind of move downwards. The diaphragm is moving down because you're creating kind of like a vacuum for air to go into your lungs. And when it does that, it basically squishes all your ab abdominal contents. And so you kind of get that, like, I don't want to say belly breathing because you shouldn't be breathing just into your belly. You should be breathing kind of like external out, out to the sides, out to the front a little bit. And then also like a little bit in the back as well. You'll get expansion kind of 360 degrees. And then your pelvic floor is at the very bottom. So it kind of has to like, eccentrically absorb, like lengthen a little bit, um, absorb all of that, um, the pressure that's coming down. And then when you exhale, you don't like exhale with your pelvic floor, but you kind of do in a way. So when you exhale, you basically just, you know, at rest, you're basically just relaxing the diaphragm. So you just kind of stop contracting it and then it like rebounds up and then the air goes out of your lungs and then your, you know, your abdominals don't expand as much and your pelvic floor kind of like it can, it rises up a little bit because obviously you don't have as much pressure bearing down into it with a forced exhale, like, you know, a Valsalva maneuver, or if you're like coughing or sneezing or, you know, doing anything that's like really forceful, getting lungs or getting lungs out of your, getting air out of your lungs, then you're going to have more of like an abdominal ass assistance with that contraction. And your pelvic floor has to be able to like handle that. Right. Because when you're increasing the abdominal pressure really quickly, your pelvic floor, like, so for example, if you have a pelvic floor, that's like always on, which a lot of us do, whether it's because, I mean, there's a ton of reasons that you could, you know, if people have had a baby in their, in their abdomen for, you know, nine months, they probably have a pelvic floor. That's like tired of holding on. And they're just like, you know, clenching because they don't want a baby to come out. I mean, obviously that's really like crude terms for saying it, but, um, that can cause tightness just like you know, tension in general. Like, I mean, I've had pelvic floor tightness from just like being stressed out and just like ab gripping, you know, you kind of, all your muscles in the abdomen area and your pelvic floor kind of respond to each other right there. I don't know exactly, you know, if things are like neurologically linked, but it's almost like things kind of activate when other things activate because they should be, because when you, you know, sneeze and your abs contract, your pelvic floor should contract. Otherwise you're going to pee. Mm -hmm. So if it's always on, it's kind of like a muscle. If it's always on, just like, you know, your upper traps or any other muscle, if it's chronically on, then you're going to have, you're more likely to like leak or have, you know, pelvic floor problems when you need that muscle to like respond and contract because it's, if it's already contracting and it's tired as hell, and then you ask it to contract more, it's probably going to give up. So that's like, I mean, there's a lot of women that have, you know, in, incontinence just with like, you know, heavy rate, weight training or, um, jump rope or things like that. Jump rope, I think is more just because the nature of that that movement, you're very like extended. So your core is kind of like open canister, you know, you can't really manage pressure properly. And then there's the impact obviously. Um, but not only like, you know, not even talking about like leaking, but like just in general, like hip tightness, like you have a muscle, your obturator internus, which is like, I've learned a lot about this muscle in the last, you know, six months or whatever. Um, so it's basically, it acts like a, it goes from your leg bone. So your femur, the top of your femur, and then it wraps into your pelvis and it's kind of on the on the inside front of your pelvis and then all your pelvic floor muscles attached to it through fascia. And so when that muscle is tight for whatever reason, you know, if your hips, if your hips are tight, a lot of the time it's because that muscle is like just holding on for dear life. Um, trying to, it's basically like a rotator cuff muscle for your hip. Mm -hmm. Um, if that's tight, then the pelvic floor gets tight as well. So you can get like weird symptoms with that. So, and it's going to affect, you know, athletes, 
mm-hmm. athletes with hip tightness, athletes with back pain, athletes with, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's a part of the body that like, we're so obsessed with like talking about the shoulder or talking about, you know, the low back or whatever, but like, we don't talk about the pelvic floor because it's in the area that like is, is private, which is true. Um, and it's hard for people to like picture, or it's awkward to talk about, but it's literally just another part of the body. And it can have such a huge impact on, um, the way that you move as well as the way that you move impacting the pelvic floor too, which obviously is important for, you know, just function life functions, to be honest. And so. men forget that they have one too. I that, the- yeah. So they yeah. don't have a pressure leakage that they necessarily have to worry about in the ways that we do, but they still have one and it still functions in the same way for yeah. their power and pressure management. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting listening to talking about this stuff. It always takes me back t- to singing because you know that I have the background in singing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. This is the stuff I wish we had talked about. Like in our strength training, we should have been talking about this stuff. Like our training should have been around this. Mm-hmm not just like doing our scales. Yeah, I agree. Or just like, even just, I mean, getting a little bit away from the pelvic floor, even though it's a big part of it, like breathing, like, I mean, I know breathing is like a super like fad buzzword right now, but like, it is something that we should be teaching or at least kind of almost like a screening thing, you know, when we're looking at like kids or athletes or clients, you know, look at how they breathe. That's their strategy. Why are they breathing like that? Like that's going to affect it's going to affect a lot of things. Obviously it'll affect, you know, their ability to, um, like work out, I guess, like, you know, breathe heavier and get their heart rate up and things like that, but also just like mechanically and then physically, like how it's going to affect how they can stabilize and what their strategy is going to be, because that's going to affect, um, their extremities and how their extremities move as well. Yeah. I mean, it was just interesting because as I moved in from, a, you know, as a former singer, when someone said, take a diaphragmatic breath, I know what that means. And I could drop into that really easily. Mm-hmm. And like, I totally, you know, when I hear belly breathing, I never, I, I'm always like, yeah, the lungs don't have the lungs aren't in the belly, but I know. <sighs> okay. Yeah. You know, it's easy for me to access that because I'm a singer, but it was surprising to me how many people don't know that. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not easy for them to act like it's not easy for them to access that. Right. And then we're putting them in positions that they can't access it because the way that like typical people are strength training, which I mean, there's a time and a place, but like for the general client that just wants to feel better. Yeah, I know. It's, it's insane. It's amazing, but it's funny. I guess not funny, but you know, I trained a long time without in before I, you know, without associating the two, like I didn't, I thought they were separate. I never even thought that what I learned singing was going to translate into how I move. I actually had a client once who was, he was like a, oh, he was a singer. I want to say he did like opera or something. But when I learned that it was awesome because I could just be like, okay, so we're going to apply this to like things that you already understand. And it just rocked his world. Like he actually got better because someone had compared to what I was trying to tell him, which was like crazy, like strength coach, athletic trainer talk to like things that he actually cared about. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to me is this is total side note and we're, I'm sorry, but you guys love me. They, they're my my podcast people. You already know that I do this. Um, But it's interesting because, you know, singers are taught like they're only, we're only, it's, I feel like we're only taught one compartment, like one portion of it. They're like taught to inhale and then keep expanding, keep expanding, keep expanding, keep the mm-hmm. container open. So they don't, we don't learn the reverse and the importance of the relaxing of the pelvic floor and the relaxing of the contraction and why the, it has to come in. So it's interesting. Like, yeah. I don't know anything about that. I'm not going to lie. It, like, but- they learn like one part of it. And I'm like, why, why? <laughs> um, but at least we're in the right direction, right? We're, yeah. not, we're starting to like pressure management. But the reason why I bring that up is I think it also relates to sports in the sense that, you know, we, we, we don't train to be resilient. We train to be competitive in our sport, in, in our, um, in our, in our, you know, whatever it is, singing, sport, Mm -hmm. field, whatever it is. And I think that that's a big difference that a lot of people forget. Yeah. They don't care about it until like, it's already threatened. (laughs) Until you get to come in, right? Yeah. Like, oh, okay. And I got hurt. Right. Yeah. 
is, you know, and, and it's also, I'm curious to hear, you know, how your school and how your, you know, your context of how you're going to really integrate preventative care because yeah. I'm, lack of a better word for lack of for I don't know why but for some reason preventative care is the hardest to sell and it's the hardest to get people on board with because people just move away from pain faster than they move towards pleasure yeah no 100 percent um well uh what I've done in the past um and what I would love to do obviously like being a PT will be it'll be different um but like as an athletic trainer and strength coach I've had you know, done like strength and conditioning camps, but like, you know, you have like strength and conditioning camps that are just, you know, everybody kind of, for not everybody, but most people are kind of familiar with, you know, kind of how they go. Um, but if there was more of like a, obviously advertised, like educational standpoint, like this is why we do this. Mm -hmm. And this is what can happen. Like, if you don't do this, and this is what can happen if you do do this, like from a performance standpoint, because if you link it to like, okay, this is, you know, what, what happens when you, um, like run this way or jump this way or whatever. And then if you jump this way and we teach you and we strengthen it through all these other, like just modalities that we can use as training tools. Um, not only like this, that's how I got interested in physical therapy was I had a cool PT athletic trainer who like basically did these like ACL injury prevention clinics and we got to lift weights, but he also got to like do really fun activities that were actually, he was like tricking us into like injury prevention and strengthening. It was really cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you could just relate it to people, what people like to do in their life, because obviously the, the point is to help them with their life. It's not to help them do what I want them to do because I have my life, they have theirs. So, I mean, just, I think connecting with people is really important, but I would love to um, like offer things like in my community, wherever that ends up being when I'm working, but just like, you know, educational, like it doesn't have to be like here, you're going to get a half of a doctor to physical therapy, but like, just, this is what you know, during daily life, this is the, this is the stuff that's going to help you not have pain during this, or this is going to help you do this better or be, have more endurance with this and like training different. I mean, even different, like you could get into like energy systems that you would train, you know, sports in, but like humans should be in them too. Like, what if you have to like go sprint down the street to save your dog mm -hmm. or something? I don't know, but I mean, obviously it's less, less common with normal general population, but it is interesting. And it just in front of cars, uh, that's not, you didn't have yeah. a time not touch wood like you that's have true. To be active yeah that's true and just like endurance there's just I mean and you could just mix it up because I think what a lot of people um a lot of people uh that are not necessarily like interested in you know like power lifting or like some specific sport where it's like okay to have just I don't want to say monotony but you know the same things practicing over and over because it is a skill and you want to get good at it so you better practice a lot but like a lot of people like to mix things up so if you can mix it up with like, okay, today we're going to be working on this. We're going to sprinkle in a little bit more of, you know, endurance work or, um, a lactic work or, you know, glycolytic work, you know, things that are just very, um, varied, different, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily in the same day, like certain things are doing, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think just if I, so what I've been trying to do, like with my Instagram and just with my, my clients that I have now is just kind of share who I am and like how I like to train and kind of try to educate a little bit where I can, when I have the brain cells to do so, because <laughs> right now my brain cells are kind of taken up. But, um, I think that the more that you just are yourself and kind of share like what you're passionate about, um, with a like true desire to help people, then people kind of come to you and they ask you questions. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to like say right now, but people give me ideas all the time. Like my clients, I learned so much from my clients, like just like, oh, that clicked for me or like, oh, I, I noticed that when I was gardening, like my back didn't hurt, you know? So just relating it to what people want to do. And I think it's a little different for everyone, but you can get certain populations like women, for example, like I'm going on a major tangent, but uh, <laughs> like women want, women want to be comfortable in their own skin. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a lot of that comes from wanting to look a certain way, but if you were just to get them to like pay attention to their skin and like learn to just auto-regulate and think about like how they're feeling and get stronger, then they're going to stop needing to look a certain way. Cause they're going to just love the way they look because they know what they can do. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I know you mentioned that you too, that you want to start working with youth, like how young, when do you want to start? Like, when do you want to start doing this work? Oh God. Um, well, I mean, I just have, I have a soft spot for like 
young women, like, you know, middle school to high school, just because I, I remember being that age. Um, and I feel like that's kind of the, the group that would probably gravitate towards me most because they're like, Oh, she's like young and likes to work out. Like maybe I could be like her. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's really, I've worked with like, you know, elementary school kids before for like strength, quote unquote, strength, strength and condition camps. And it's fun to work with them too. So I don't know. I, I like the, the high school level because you can really, they're just like little sponges. You know, if you're actually like someone that's engaging, then they'll just, they can learn so much from you, you know, and you're inspiring them to go and study things in college, you know? So that's really cool. So I would say probably high school. Um, plus, you know, they're kind of experiencing, like they're getting more competitive in their sports. They're, you know, they're going through or have gone through puberty and are kind of like either not liking their bodies, you know, or, or maybe they you just like, don't really understand what the hell's going on. So I don't know. I, th- I think probably high school. Um, and I think it could be really beneficial too, because especially now, like, I feel like just, I mean, maybe this is just because of COVID, but like, there's so many kids that are like struggling for connection right mm. now. And I, I think that'll probably go away, hopefully once everything kind of calms down, but I don't know. I'm worried about like the future mental health of our youth going yeah, up I, now. Honestly, I, I'm, I think that we have yet to see the impact and we're not going to really fully understand the impact of this time and what it's done to our youth. I, I think, yeah, I think we're going to have to wait to see what that's going to do, but it is make no mistake. It's going to, it's made already made an impact, but we'll see what the full impact is later. Mm-hmm. But I agree. I think it's connection is so important and it's easy to just pretend that we don't need it or that the zoom is enough mm. when it's really not mm-hmm. like people need have like physical touch hugs they need to be interactive they need to be able to connect get into different energetic force fields yeah 100 percent. and i can attest to that being in a hybrid program because it's totally different being you know in zoom class during the week or even like our asynchronous lectures versus like in lab like i go to waco every two months the lab and it's just you I, I i thought baylor was in texas yeah so so because it's a hybrid program like literally all of my didactics are online. So I have, um, asynchronous lectures, which are like, they're not synchronous. So I'm by myself have to just complete them. And then the same subjects, I will have synchronous lectures during the week, like normal, normal class load or whatever. Um, and then, you know, the weekends are typically when I get my asyncs done. So it's really just like nonstop, but then every, uh, six to eight weeks or so we have, um, lab immersions. So, I go down there. My first one was in February and it was two weeks long. So, you know, you just pick random people to stay with. Um, And since it's COVID, we are all, you know, um, set with a certain group of people that we had to kind of just interact with the whole lab. Mm -hmm. Um, But luckily I lucked out with my house and they were awesome. And like, I'm already like invited to someone's wedding. Like it's been, it was so cool. Just really clicking with people and like being in person. Um, But, and then I go back again in a couple of weeks, but yeah. So every Every other month this year, I'll be going down there for a week or two. And then next year I'll be in my clinical rotation. So I don't know like where those will be yet, but we have, uh, I think there's three labs next week, next week, next year. And then, um, our graduation. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's actually, there's several programs like this now. And I think after this year, there'll be a lot more, like there's people like that were before like kind of scoffing at it and now they're like hey so what are you doing over there you know they're like oh wow that's a really good idea and like look you're pumping out amazing pts in two years like i mean it's it's not necessarily cheaper for tuition wise but it's cheaper in the long run because you're going to be working faster mm-hmm. um and another thing that i really like about it um is that they're very they're very big on like they don't like push us to do residencies or fellowships, but they're very, they're very much like educating us on it and like suggesting it from the get go. And that's something I'm really interested in doing. The only problem is like, I don't think there's anyone doing exactly what I want to do, but I think I could, um, pay really pay. Yeah. Well, I wish, well, there's, there's, there's certain people that I kind of look up to and that I definitely look up to in the field. Um, as far as like that are kind of doing similar things to what I'd like to do. Uh, that I would love to have as mentors, but yeah, I mean, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I want to see like how clinical rotations go and everything too, but yeah, it's, it's a, uh, most of my stuff, mo- all my classes are online and then I just go down to Waco every other month. So casually, <laughs> yeah. casually, just a, just a quick hop on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> what caused you to go from, you know, strength and conditioning to also adding the, the physical therapy doctorate? Yeah. So, um, 
I, so like I, I mentioned briefly before, so I'm a certified athletic trainer and I was actually in my undergrad, I was planning on PT until like the last, uh, trimester of my undergrad. And I decided to go athletic training because, um, I did and an, I went to the university of Washington for undergrad and I was doing an internship sports medicine internship and working with their football team. And their athletic training staff is just like, they're just the coolest people. Like they're still there. There've been coaches overturned and like, they have stayed there. They just, they're just awesome. And so I was like, wow, you guys are so cool. I want to be like you. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I changed my mind and I decided to go and get my master's in athletic training. Um, and kind of like while I was down there working, working like my clinical rotations there, um, in obviously college, I was in the SEC. So it was like very, it was pretty intense, like very good college sports. Like Arkansas track and field is amazing. Arkansas football is obviously SEC football. Um, and I just kind of realized like, while it is really a cool experience to work those sports, I just knew the lifestyle wasn't for me mm -hmm. to work college. Like, I mean, during the season, it's, it's pretty insane. And then during the off season, it's really not, but I just, I just kind of knew in my gut that I didn't want to do that. Like it's, it's not really what I saw myself doing, like when I was a parent or, or even like not a parent, just in general, trying to settle down. And so I decided to work high school. And then when I was working high school, uh, I really loved working with the kids. I loved watching all the different sports. Um, it's, you have to deal with a lot of different humans when you work high school athletic training you know you're dealing with parents you're dealing with admin you're dealing with coaches you're dealing with students you're dealing with like doctors everybody um but what I didn't like was my favorite part and my favorite part like as a personal trainer on the side is obviously working with people and getting them stronger and like figuring out their problem and then solving it and with athletic training at least at the high school level you really don't get to like take them from zero to back to play because that's you're referring them to a PT. Um, and so I kind of just realized like, Hey, they're taking the part that like, I really want to do. And so why, I mean, obviously going back to school after I've already gotten a master's degree, because I changed my mind, like there's everything happens for a reason. And it was not an ideal, you know, like, Hey, let's go spend more money on loans. But, um, I just, I just knew in my gut that I was not doing what I was meant to do. And so here I am. There you are. But now you have this comprehensive look that most people yeah. don't have. Yeah. It's taken some time, but, and I feel like I, I mean, it is definitely, it's been beneficial to be, I think older. Like I cannot, I can't imagine going right into a PT program like this out of undergrad. Like I, I know I personally wouldn't have been able to handle it. I have classmates that are like 22 and I tap my, take my head off to them because it is, it is incredible the maturity that you have to have in order to handle this amount of work, um, especially when you're, you know, 22 years old. So, yeah. So I think, I think I'm at the right place where I'm supposed to be now, but, and it definitely has helped that I'm older and that I have a little bit of a background um, in this kind of stuff. So. So cool. So cool. I can't wait. I can't wait. You're going to have some amazing things are, gonna, <laughs> are already coming for you from you and you're going to just change the world. So it's exciting. I'm Thank you. Hope so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I definitely want to be respectful of your time. So for those of you who want to learn more about working from you, learning from you, any connecting with you, where should I send that? Yeah. So, um, my Instagram is Megzi, M E G S I 072, uh, really random name. Uh, seven's my favorite number, but seven was taken. So I had to choose the two. Um, anyway, that's my Instagram handle. And then my website is Barrington Kinetics. So Barrington, my last name, it'll be on the title of the episode and then kinetics like movement, um, dot com. That's my website. And then, um, yeah, that's pretty much the, those are the best ways to get in contact with me. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. If you haven't already, be sure to hit subscribe and tap that bell to be notified when the latest and greatest video comes out. I'll catch you on the next video.